Welcome to the dark forest. Jackie and her pals will never bore us. Shameless confessions about our obsession will make us laugh and smile. So let's explore the dark forest and dork down for a while. Hi, I'm Jackie Cation, and you're listening to the Dork Forest. You've done it. You've chosen wisely. Uh, the website's JackieCation.com, DorkForest.com, TheDorkForest.com. Uh, JackieCation.com has everything, right? This podcast, uh, links to my other podcast, links to my calendar for when stand-up comedy happens again, uh, links to the merch if you want a Ranger of the Dork Forest t-shirt. If you want any of my stand-up uh, merchandise, there's a bunch of new merch over there. There's uh, the old pins. There's new. There's a new challenge coin. There's a bunch of t-shirts. There's CDs. There's my DVD. And uh, there's some video, and there's more of the information that you could deal with. Also, so that's on the that's on JackieCation.com, and there's a link on, of course, DorkForest.com to the merch page. Uh, the other thing you could do is you go to iTunes and review the show. That's always something that's supposed to help. Hi. You might be listening to the show on Pandora or Spotify or Amazon or Stitcher or some other place. Anyway, you might be just listening to it at dorkforest.com, which will also have the videos. As long as we're in COVID, as long as we're in quarantine, I am doing Zoom. I'm doing this show as also a video show. So you can go to the YouTube page and get a bunch of that. That also has a bunch of my stand-up clips on it as well. Let's do the credits. Hey, Mike Rickberg wrote and composed that song that you just heard, and he sang it with his wife, Sarah. He will sing at the end of the program uh, his words to the Mexican hat dance. Very glamorous. Uh, Patrick Brady fixes the audio, the video. He does everything, and he really kind of keeps me sane. Loving Patrick uh, Brady, especially uh, in these days. And then uh, Vilmos uh, keeps uh, JackieCation.com rocking and rolling, as the kids say. There are several ways to support the show. I've already mentioned reviewing the show on iTunes. Uh, you could also you could also just tell people that you love the show. That's always something. You could repost it if it's a particular episode you enjoy. You could join the Ranger page on Facebook if you like. That's just a bunch of people who love the show, and they can riff on each other and, and, and talk about the show and dorky things that they love themselves. My Twitter, Instagram, and all things Snapchat at Jackie Cation. If you ever want to get in touch with me, it's Jackie at JackieCation.com. That's my email address. And uh, if you want to donate, you can just give me money, quite honestly. You can PayPal me, Jackie at JackieCation.com, or use the button on JackieCation.com or DorkForest.com, and it comes directly to me. I will use it, in this case, enormously wisely on things like shelter and food uh, until I'm on the road again. And then, uh, and I appreciate whatever you could send. If you want to make it monthly, if you do monthly things, you can make the PayPal thing monthly. You can also, if you don't like PayPal, you can pay me by Venmo. My Venmo is just my name, Jackie hyphen Cation. And then a picture of me windswept, I believe. Uh, other than that, um, yeah. Uh, oh, Bandcamp. You, if you've run out of episodes to watch and would like more, there are live episodes on band, dorkforest.bandcamp.com. And there's uh, a bunch of episodes. There's 200 episodes before I started pre-recording. The best 17 of the horrible audio that they were are on Bandcamp. So you can listen to those for free. There's a bunch of uh, live ones that are like two bucks a piece because they cost me some money to produce. So I charge you a couple of bucks. There's also a storytelling album if you like that. So much info. Let's get into the show. Hi, it's Jackie Cation. We're trying a new thing, Rangers. We're having two people, two people on a Zoom call. Will it work? Let's find out because these are delightful people. These are these are good eggs. I I think I think we we know that. And so um, let's let's do it uh, from the top. That's where I'm at. Ron Babcock. Uh, welcome to the program. Welcome back to the program. I oh, thank you for having me, Jackie. I'm always excited to be on Dork Force. And it's at Ron Babcock, oddly enough. That's the Twitter and all the things. Yeah. You know, I, I, it took me a while to come up with it, but I'm really happy that I actually landed on that. That's what I like about you is you're always writing. And what, um, what do, do you have albums and stuff where people should go and? Uh, yeah, I got a, an album um, and uh, you can, I think it's more difficult to actually buy it uh, than to listen to it for free at this point. So <laughs> you could listen to my album, This Guy on Spotify. Uh, you either just search for this guy or Ron Babcock and it comes right up. 
There you go. And then and, and, um, yeah, I got the best compliment on it. A bunch of people work at a restaurant said yeah. they would uh, play it when they would set up the restaurant in the morning. And I oh. was just like, that's the nicest thing <laughs> for some reason. I was like, I love that. Yeah. You're cheering people up right before work. That is, uh, that is, uh, you're part of the solution, my friend. Well, well played. Uh, and then we also have, uh, Ryan Mc McKee. Uh, I always want to add another syllable. Ryan, talk to me. Welcome to the program. You haven't been on before. Have you? Uh Oh, no, this is my very first time. And I feel very good about, uh, uh, being here with Ron. (laughs) <laughs> good because you guys work on the thing you work on what your dorkdom is which i usually frown on this who wants to talk about work but you love it so and you have for for a long time you guys had that you know ryan your uh, mic is cutting out so i don't know if it's the, the cord yeah um that's better we can hear the ums try unplugging the x alarm uh and then plugging it back in okay You hear me okay now? Yeah. Let's uh, hopefully uh, it's because it was cutting in and out, so it might have just been a short or something. Okay. Sorry about that. I think that I think it's a lot better now. I I I certainly I love it for what we're going to keep all this in, right? Uh, probably. I did yeah. write down the word edit, but uh, I'm loath because there's there's so many files, and Patrick Brady is a delight, but to add to his workload. <laughs> <laughs> feels rude so uh and who doesn't want to hear the magic who doesn't want to see behind the curtain uh ryan mckee who by the way is at the ryan mckee m-c-k-e-e uh talk to me about uh where people can get more of you besides that uh you can also go to modestproposal.co to buy our book other than oh, that's right how much all you're going to get from me i don't have a comedy album out I know. I, I, that's what I was like. Don't guess that he has one out. Ryan won one? an Emmy, though. So Four. he actually has an Emmy. Yeah, but I don't know if you have to, like, throw that in right now, Ron. Oh, oh yeah, you do. Yeah, he does. Uh, what'd you get the Emmy for there, Ryan? I wrote a, uh, I wrote a scripted short-form series that starred James Corden called James Corden's Next James Corden, and it won the 2018 short-form uh, scripted Emmy, I think is what it is. Yeah, that's right. Take that, Megan Amram. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Megan Amram. We beat you. Uh, was she also in the... Oh, she was gunning so hard for it. Gunning hard for it, but... Uh, yeah, billboards and stuff. And we all thought we were going to lose to her. I was like, Ryan, I, I love you, but you're, you're not going to win this. And then he did. <laughs> yeah, I thought so too. That is hilarious. Um... So yeah, Modest Proposal Anthology is the magazine that you guys did for several years, right? It was an anthology of, of just short stories and, and essays and stuff, right? No, so Modest nope. Proposal <laughs> was independent uh, comedy magazine. We did a lot of interviews with uh, comedians like Maria Bamford, Zach Galifianakis, Dave Chappelle, David Tell, all the hits. You were very <laughs> close to being interviewed. <laughs> we don't know about it jackie is the first time ron and i ever came to la to perform at a stand-up comedy show um you were the only one who was nice to us we bombed and you went up yeah. right after us and Pat and oswald hooked us up with the set and we thought we were just gonna like man we thought we were gonna murder like ryan i, mean, I was like man call the police because there's gonna be a murder up in here we're gonna take this home and then we just ate it in front of the hip comedy elite so hard and you were the only person who was delightful to us and we gave you a copy of the magazine and you were very nice about it and uh we were going to interview but then we stopped doing the magazine so you just missed the cut sorry (laughs) right well it's always interesting um when i don't know about something in the industry it's actually the odds are i don't so um but it does sound like a very nice magazine and good. Are, are, can, people could buy the collected book, you said, at modestproposal.co? Yep, it's on Amazon. You can just Google it, Modest Proposal Anthology, and it'll come right up. Actually, it even comes up if you Google Modest Proposal. You don't even need to worry about spelling the word anthology. Right. right. 
Okay. And now, and so, so now you guys are like, you're both wearing the t-shirt. That is very glamorous. Yes. Yep. And, oh, I usually make people co-hosts if they need to ever share anything. That's my, that's my new thing. Cause these are now available on, on, on the YouTube. And so people can look at us. Oh. Talk oh. About their dorkdoms. And, um, very cool. Yeah. So, but what do you, what, uh, so what is it person is your dorkdom sort of indie started magazines? Uh, so to be specific, uh, we, you know, I got, I was very into punk rock in the nineties when I was in high school and I started learning about, they called them just zines back then. That's what all the cool kids call them. That was where you self-published a magazine about something you were passionate about. And it was almost always punk rock, or it was a memoir about a road trip, or it was like uh, comics that you drew yourself. So or it was so a comic about a memoir of a punk rock road trip. <laughs> so punk rock, of course, uh, glad to introduce music into the topic. I know even less about this. Uh, Sid Vicious, this is a punk rock person, if I'm correct. Punk rock person, very good. Yeah, the, good cl- the Clash? We don't know. I don't. I, that's where I think I lose. Uh, I don't know anything about it. Elvis Costello? No. Yeah, at this point, this was like in the mid 90s. So the big bands were like, Blink 182 and Mighty Mighty Boston's. Are these ringing a bell for you? I thought the Mi- and I'm going to say this out loud. Yes, I am. I thought the Mighty Mighty Boston's were ska. Am I wrong? Well, they're ska punk. A little bit of okay. Bo- oh, we- uh, we- oh, okay. So that sort of rage, but in a with with a good beat, and the kids can dance to it. Yep. Yep. All and- right. So I was seeing all these independent zines and thinking, why isn't nobody doing one of these about comedy? You know, where you, you know, they were just interviewing musicians and writing their own stories. I was like, I was real nerdy about comedy. I was like, why? I I would love to get a chance to interview some of the comics. I was in Arizona, so I was seeing comics at the Tempe Improv and Mm -hmm. I wanted an excuse to talk to some of these people. And so I thought this is good work. Huge. This is going to be huge. I'm going to do a comedy zine and it's going to be the only one of its kind and people are going to love it. And guess what? What? Uh, nobody really cared about it <laughs> <laughs> because they didn't understand it. It wasn't music. It wasn't a memoir. It wasn't comics. They were like, why are you doing something about com- comedy? Wasn't, you know, you were doing comedy at this time. Comedy wasn't necessarily cool back then. Um, it's never been cool. It never will be cool. Get over yourselves. Uh, it is always uh, the love of my life uh, and the joy of my existence, but it is not. Once it's cool, you're a dick. I mean, the thing is, is once you you made stand-up comedy cool, you've broken it. Congratulations, you and your dude bros should go. I don't know, circle jerk yourself into hell. Um, wow. To Jane Dane Cook. Uh, I have uh, there's a there's a there's a, a, a there's a lateral line. I mean, Dane Cook. I mean, these are these are all, by the way, the names that I will say. These are people that I could all grow. They could become decent human beings one day. But there's there's a whatever you become super popular. Um, you have this this there's there's the temptation to think that you're right. Right. Like, look at CK. Look at Louis C.K. He thought that he was he was such a genius that he could do anything. And people would think it was funny. People wouldn't think it was uh, wrong, uh, even though he knew it was, you know, like uh, Joe Rogan has political views based on the same information I have. Uh, I have political views, but I only have 11,000 followers. So uh, it's, I, I'm, not, I'm not telling people to wear a tin foil hat, but I mean, these are all people that can grow up and, and not, but once, once you're super, like when Joe Piscopo got buff, we were like, yeah, you used to be a nerd. Like uh, uh, who is the guy on Breakfast Club uh, who uh, also got buff? Anthony Michael Hall. Anthony Michael Hall, yeah. It's a little weird when you see your like 80s nerds, like carrot tops, like ripped. Right. Right. Again, you're just it's, like, I'm, it's just I'm unexpected. Happy. Right. I'm happy that you have, you know, it's probably better for your heart uh, where you're, you're probably eating. You know, and but exercising. It, it, it's the kind of ripped where it's like, what are you, what hole are you trying to fill right now? Where it's just too shredded. 
where right. you're like, what is going on? Like, it's just so insanely fit. Right. But what I'm seeing is a, is a, is a young Ryan McKee interviewing the comics that he loves. And it's not cool at all. But you're like, I love meeting you. Let's talk about you and comedy. And yeah. that should have been a, a huge hit because there's people who needed that magazine. They needed that scene in their lives. You well, yeah, so. that's what yes. I thought. And, <laughs> and and Ron begged me like, hey, instead of spending all this money on publishing this and cutting down trees and stuff. Jackie, it was so expensive. It was so expensive to, you know what's cost a lot? Making 1500 copies of a magazine. It cost thousands of dollars to print that. You know what doesn't cost that much? Hmm. Putting it up on a website. And Ryan was so adamant to be like, no man, we're not gonna do a website because there's something about holding a magazine in your hands. And I'm like, well, can we, can we also have a website in addition to holding a magazine in your hands? He's like, no man, this is punk rock. People are gonna come to us. It's gonna be like a collector's item. So yeah, so, you, so we got has, that ever, has that ever happened? We have Is a that, bunch of collector's items in our closet right now. If anyone's right. interested, if you're pr if you're printing fifteen hundred an issue and nobody and and fifteen hundred people don't want them, uh, that gives you a lot of extra merch right there. Uh, but what? Uh, but was there ever a zine that that worked? Yeah, uh, you know. So Dave Eggers, the famous writer, now he started by doing. This is where I got the idea. He started by doing Might magazine in like the early 90s in San Francisco and it you know it blew up with like all the critics but it was never financially able to sustain so it folded and I was oh. like that's what I have to do I have to make something that's a hit with the critics and then it'll fold financially but then I'll be I'll be you know skyrocketed into writer stardom <laughs> Ryan had this plan in his head which by the way he never told me about like this is all news to me for his grand scheme he was like you know budgeting in our, our inevitable failure but we <laughs> did we did like interview all these comics who they were legitimate like working comics at the time but now they're household names and before that like like we were interviewing Jim Gaffigan and nobody like people kind of knew who he was, but it was all these people who then went on to achieve, um, you know, pretty, pretty impressive uh, success. Stand up super, su super stardom. Yeah. I mean, the whole, situation. like, I mean, we got everybody in there uh, passed through and now like, so the anthology was basically a way of like, it was like, well, what we should, we should just publish those uh, interviews again. And then we got a bunch of people to go back and comment on their interviews. And that's ah. the most fun because then like you just see David Cross is just read something. He's like, oh man, I was so full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> see, for example, David Cross, hugely popular cult favorite and uh, had uh, this, he doesn't need to hear this, but good news. He is not listening. Um, the, uh, <laughs> He had, the, for three years, I introduced myself to him and he never re remembered me. And so I just started after like the sixth or seventh time, every time I'd see him, I'd always go, Jackie Cation, David Cross, nice to, nice to see you. And by the third year of that, he was like, Jackie Cation, I know, I know. And I was like, well, I mean, the, and he meets a hundred thousand people, but he was, he, he, he did have, when he put out his two hour album without edits, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's an ego issue. But I think he has grown over that. Like, I think I think he got over a hump of 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 with and, and just sort of sort of realized that, you know, because I think we all have to do that where you're like, no, no, I'm full of shit. And yeah, I, Ryan and I got over that hump pretty quick. <laughs> well, so, some people, uh, some people are just nice people the whole time, or they never become famous and, uh, or they never get any sort of success and it doesn't, isn't a problem, but there's another problem then. And that's called bitterness. And, uh, <laughs> that's a different, <laughs> that's most of it. That's most so, of the people. I do want to hear about Mike magazine though. Cause, uh, first of all, I know David, Egg I know the Eggers name. Who is he? Who just tell, tell me. He is a writer, but he also started uh, McSweeney's, uh, which is a you know big publishing company, and also satire or satire humor publication online. He's uh, basically Ryan's favorite person. Oh, he, nice! Yeah, 
I, I, I write this in the book. If you wanted to hack any of my email or online accounts, I had some version of Eggers in the password, whether it be like Eggers 1970. <laughs> that. So you could probably go back and hack any of my old accounts. If you want to hack my, 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 my space, that's probably one of them. Um, <laughs> but yeah. So he, and then he, so he started this magazine. It failed, but like a bunch of, you know, popular writers worked for it at the time. And uh, then he wrote a book about it called A Heartbreaking Work of Staggering Genius. And I read it in college and I thought, oh, this is now what I want to do with my life. I just want to make a, you know, independent publication with my friends and have it become beloved by critics. And uh, I did the first part, but not so much the second part. <laughs> well, it's it's interesting. Um... It sounds the heartbreaking, staggering, that business. Uh, it makes me think of uh, David Foster Wallace. Um, Who is a contemporary of his. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah. Is Edgar still alive? Did he kill himself? Is he, how's he doing? He is still alive, married with children. Um, I don't think he was as depressed as David Foster Wallace. Right, right. And, uh, and hopefully we'll die in his bed of old age, like George Carlin. That'll be nice. Yeah. Um, and also, but also very talented. Uh, so was Might a humor magazine back in the day? Or was it a music punk? No, it was definitely not music punk. It was somewhere along what McSweeney's maybe is now. It was kind of a satirical essay humor uh very very smart people wrote for it like david foster wallace so you can't really speaking of collector's items you can't really find copies of the magazine anymore unless you go on at C or i mean ebay and spend like hundreds of dollars uh there's only one collection uh that you can find of it now it's kind of like mike magazine i think like track a shiny adidas suits and something like that it's, it's named after one of the essays in it but uh it's hard to find any of it so I was obsessed with like that. I was like, I, that's what I wanted to become. I also had met, um, there's a guy in Atlanta named Henry Owens. He's kind of in the comedy community too. I think he was the original, one of like the original road managers of the comedians of comedy. Okay. And I was in, influenced by him too, because he does this magazine called Chunklet that was kind of, that was mostly music, but he also interviewed some comedians. So I was really- He would do it once a year too. And his first edition was just one sheet of paper, like a front and a back of one sheet of paper. And then he did, I mean, I think we met him when he was doing it like already 18 years. And it was like, it was almost an inch thick by that time. It was, in, and it was jam packed with so much stuff. Like there wasn't a lot of breathing room in that publication. What did, uh, what kind of, um... What, what year did he start? I think he started in the 90s. And we taught, you know, when I started talking to him in the early aughts, mm -hmm. you know, he had, I think he was on episode or issue 18. He, but he did like one a year. And like, like Ron is saying, it was like a, a Bible thick by that point. And it was, uh, I mean, he would, it was just so, it was so cool because he would do music and he would do, um, you know, like, like a lot of like just comedy bits about that. But then he would also interview, yeah, like Ryan said, comics. And so, we looked at that and we were like, well, what if we did something that was just more comedy and like a little tiny bit of music rather than the other way around? And was you, was Modest, was Modest Proposal more than once a year? Yes. I mean, we did it for three years and we put out six issues. So I but guess it was, I, I don't want to put, like give the idea like, oh, we were it, in true zine fashion. We weren't like new issue every three months. It was just like new issue when we get to it. It was <laughs> right, not a very steady publishing schedule. Because that's the, that's the zine way. Not a lot of people live by a code anymore. I think. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the zine way was like new issue whenever I get to my mom's office on a weekend and I could use the photocopier. <laughs> right. So you're photocopying these things and, and putting them together. Was that sort of the way they were no, all done? Or That's the way most zines were done. And a lot of zines uh, we love were done like that. But we actually... We wanted to be like a professional looking zine. Some would say we wanted to be a MAGA zine. Did Ryan want to spend a lot of money? And so you guys were like, we're going to publish this. Ryan, yeah, because Ryan used to be a forest fighter for the Arizona forestry, a wildlife forest fighter. And he put all his money into this magazine. Yeah. <laughs> I, 
so I graduated from Arizona State with an English degree, which means I had no talent or way to do any kind of career, you know? The world was open to you, man. Yeah. That's what it was. <laughs> so I, I convinced my friends who never went to college, because I grew up in Northern Arizona, to uh, vouch for me to be on the Forest Service fighting forest fires. And I saved up money for like two fire seasons. And then I just blew it all on an independent magazine <laughs> on publishing because I couldn't, I wasn't very good at like selling ads or anything like that. They just vouched for you and you got to go fight fires? Yeah. Did you? Yeah. What? Uh, yeah. You, there's no training? There's no... Uh, I mean, I knew, I knew Ryan before that. And I got to say, like, if you asked all my friends, hey, which one of your friends do you think is going to be a firefighter? <laughs> Ryan would have been like... I don't even last is the word like he wouldn't even made the list. Oh, but you know what was so sweet is like Ron saw me about a year and a half into doing it and he was so turned on by my body. <laughs> I, I, Jackie, I could not get over it. He was tan. He was ripped. And I was like, dude, you look amazing. Like he like he had to lose like 30 pounds. I was like, dude, you look incredible. I was so impressed. It was the most in shape I've ever been. Yeah. Wow, do you have any pictures of that? Not that I'm attracted to firefighters, but I would really like to see a picture of Brian uh, McKee. <laughs> so did you just soot all over your face? You go in, yeah, Wait, I gotta go back in. I can dig up some photos. I mean, this was before like everybody had an iPhone, so I didn't have like Shh. photos, but I literally have like printed photos that I could <laughs> That you could take a picture of and you're like, no, no, this is because I would like a calendar. So um what ron so your favorite was might what was what was your favorite uh zine of, from the 90s or or today i would as, say as, uh i love the i love chunkla that i thought was like the coolest zine um and that was even like it grew into like just being like a pretty cool independent magazine um there was one called comet bus that i always loved and comic bus C comet bus comet uh, and then comet a bus. bus yeah and he okay he would always like hand write his zines and he had this like in, impeccable, um, you know, just like handwriting. So it looked like a font, but it was just him handwriting this thing over and over and just having, you know, thick with text. And I, I, there was also like, uh, Ryan turned me on to one called uh, Fart Party, uh, which was a comic. And I always, I always like the comic scenes too. Um, okay. So you like when there's more art and- yeah. Uh and then the words are, are there as well of course yeah i mean that's the thing is like there's so many that came out and they were so fun but the one thing about them was they always felt a little bit almost disposable because they were just i mean you know there was different degrees of printing but at the very base it was just like yeah printed on your mom's you know photocopier from her insurance job right and so you you read it and you probably would consume them honestly in like less than an hour some of you would consume in 15 minutes and then you would like what do i do with this and Ryan you know because you always wanted to have something you could hold in your hands like we wanted to have something that was a little bit more um, substantial you know even something dare I say a color cover and uh -huh. we with would, black and white are, are they traditionally just all just black and white a lot awesome. of them yeah, yeah a lot of and, them but so the thing is is I think I know what you're talking about I lived in Minneapolis in the 90s and um there was a lot of talk about a band called Hoosker Do. Was that a punk band? Oh yeah. There oh, we yeah. go. Uh, Bob sure. Mold. Oh yeah. Okay. I can. I can. I can come up with some. You still got it, Jackie. You still got it. You can hang. <laughs> the good news is, never had it, so always a surprise. Whatever I have it at all. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, but I they were they were I worked at Kinkos from 1980, 1990 to 1991, literally the worst job I've ever had. Anyway, but uh, there were so many guys, there were all of the people, men, women, all of the people who worked there were in bands. And so they uh, were using Kinko's to make their J boxes and their posters. Uh, the J boxes are the, are the piece the, the cardboard that you put a, a cassette tape in. And um, that's what they were called the J. Uh, and so they would do their art and then they would use the cutting machine. And so I think that there was a couple people doing zines and people would come in to print the zines. And it was always like, it was like, it was like a piece of paper with 
just really shitty sort of handwriting. And then um, like really next to it, there'd be like a picture of a man's face. Yeah, and, like something they'd it, cut out of a magazine and tape in. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes it was it was like it was either hand drawn or yeah, I like the idea of it being more of a diorama, kind of a uh, maybe they were the first uh, vision boards. Oh, oh my I'm, God. That's a good way of putting it. Well, what I liked about it was that you could, you, you didn't, you just could, if you wanted to say something, you could just make it. And there was something very empowering with that. And we were like, well, let's do like a really polished scene, which we thought that zine people would see and would be like, whoa that's really cool. Like, look at how polished is it. Cause we, you know, we learned like the design software, we got it actually printed up at, at like a, you know, a print company. We had the little you know, staples that would be all in it. And there's a lot of times we would go to these zine like symposiums and they would look at this and they would be like, Whoa, wow. You guys uh, like, looks like you kind of sold out. <laughs> it's just like, like we, we were trying too hard. It, we, it yeah. wasn't, it wasn't punk rock enough. And so we would go into the normal magazine, like like stores and be like, hey, can we sell our magazine here? And they would go, oh, this is a little too like rinky dink because you don't even have a glossy cover. And yeah. we couldn't do a glossy cover. That was like an extra $3,000. Right. So we were like caught in the middle of being not punk rock enough and also not glossy enough. Right, because you liked the punk rock ones, but you didn't want to produce the punk rock ones because you wanted it to look nice. Exactly. Because I was I was obsessed with Might magazine and they had, you know, taken it up a notch and they looked like a regular magazine because they had like, uh, you know, some graphic designers working for them and stuff who were their friends. We weren't graphic designers and we didn't have graphic design friends, but we tried to, ep rep, you know. Sure. We learned it on the on the magazine. I mean, the first issue. I remember we got a review back on the first issue where they were like, Hey, this, there's a lot of funny stuff in here, but it looks like it was printed on shag carpeting and <laughs> the design is like God awful. Like, cause we just didn't know anything. And then by the end of it, like it actually looked like a real magazine you would find at a store. Right. And that's, and what, the <laughs> yeah, that's what we quit. <laughs> what about, um, did my magazine have the glossy color cover? Uh, you know, I, I think they did at, by the end of it, but I had only got my hands on a couple of copies ever. So, you know, it was more like I just like loved the lore of it and reading about it in a heartbreaking work of staggering genius. Oh, OK, because because there's 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 got to be like this is this is the 90s. So we're talking about like alt boards, right? Like, are you on mm -hmm. they're, they're like the the Reddit of the 1990s were these weird uh, boards. Is that how you'd find out about new ones? No, I mean, Really, at that time, there was like a couple of different guides that you could send away for. There was there was a magazine called Zine World and another one called Zine Guide. And all it was was just like a, a printing of like different zines and like a, a brief review about it. And then like a P.O. box where you would send away like three dollars and they okay. would send one back. And you never knew if it would like actually come back or not. You just kind of hoped that. <laughs> send away for it and it would come back. And I actually used to review zines for zine world. So I would get free zines sent to me and then I would review them. I wasn't paid or anything. Just I did that out of because I wanted free zines. That's where I that was the way of getting your zine out there. So I remember we were got to zine world. We're like, this is the big deal. <laughs> like, you yeah. Know, like, you yeah, yeah. Celebrate. And yeah. and who published zine world and Z and or Z or zine guide who published those two? I don't know. It was just some people who were big zine fans. It wasn't like a company or anything like that. It was. It's weird. Like before the internet, like it, you could see like zines kind of turned into like live journal, you know, where, and they coexisted at the same time, but like mm -hmm. you kind of like everybody before you could put it online in a virtual space, people were just putting it on like, you know, eight and a half by 11 white pieces of computer paper. Yeah. So this for like blogs really took off as like a common thing, you know, like it was still kind of a punchline. And again, this is like well before MySpace or, you know, like Friendster wasn't even yet. So the whole like online boom hadn't happened yet. And I didn't see it coming. And I was like, oh yeah. Oh my God, Jackie, there's so much we didn't see coming. That was like right <laughs> in front of our face. And and there were people who told us like, you should probably put this stuff online. This is, there's probably people out there who would really like this. And we're like, listen, buddy, 
why don't you shut up, Dave? Because <laughs> we don't need your help. We know what we're doing. <laughs> You're like, we're busy being too cool with the print copy. We don't want to we don't want to lose our any cred by going online. I got to tell you, that was the worst part, like with comedy in like the early 2000s. There was that that idea that if you cared, it wasn't cool. And it was so frustrating because at my core, I'm a person who who I care. I care yeah. so much. And I, Jack, I know you're the same exact way. And people you're would a like- hard, Look. You're a hardworking uh, comic who wants people to have a really good time. And yeah, you want to keep working on your craft. Do yeah. you remember that? Like that yeah. whole world for like the good early 2000s in LA from 2000 to 2010, it was just like, okay, oh. why don't you stop trying so hard? Uh, literally, it had to be this thing where you would kick back and you'd be like, no, it doesn't matter to me. And then if, but if you were to see inside their minds, they were running a hamster wheel yeah. because it's a, the best example is, um, uh, did you ever see the fantastic Mr. Fox? Yes. Yes. And who did that? Uh, Wes Anderson. There we go. And this was weirdly enough, this is the second time this come up in a dork forest, but he personifies for me sort of the best of that and the worst of that, which is like, no, me and just some good friends put together, you know, a stop action movie uh, just over a weekend. You can like it. You can not like it. No, no. Stop action is 40 hours a day and Meryl Streep is in it. No, you care. You care. And you can't you in, in 1999 to try to walk up to Karen Kilgariff and go, you care. She would go, do not. <laughs> and uh you know it was it was Kilgara and Paul of Tompkins and 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 Patton and ex Patton was more er earnest he but you had to hide it you had to hide that you cared and that you were working really hard that you were just like no I just love to do it man I hope you like it it's like you know trying to make it look like you're all just stumbling into a bucket of success right but you had to have written it you mm -hmm. I mean, even like the alt comedy scene, you know, you'd see people go on stage and you'd be like, well, you need to. Yeah, uh, you, you had to come up with something. I mean, Janine Garofalo one time bef at Largo when Largo in 1999 before it moved to the big theater. Um, she, she was standing outside smoking and I walked up and uh, she said hi very nice and she said i just went and bought a cd and listened to it in my car because i don't have anything to talk about tonight and i was like oh jesus christ go to the vault go to the vault why wouldn't you why wouldn't you just do material that they haven't heard before because it sounded too polished if it sounded too polished they would would get in your face a little bit yeah it was like if you worked on it they'd be like mm -hmm. listen man we don't need any of that you know, right. We want to be the first time you say it because we want it to be special. And if you said it before and it's polished, it's not special. Uh, even though it now has two punchlines. How about that? What about <laughs> the exciting world of punchlines? Uh, yeah. So that's what the zine thing was. So, so how did it, so if it's all just happening organically in these tiny, tiny towns, how did you get a zine? How does one get a zine into these things? You just send it to that PO box and go, will you read my zine and review it? Yeah, you would send your zine to other zines, hoping that they would write about it. And then other people would read their zines and read about your zines and then send away for it. I mean, we had a PO box that people would just send like $3. And then we would send it off to them. And that's how we got it. And then we also would go to zine conferences. Like we would travel to zine con. Oh, and uh, Los Angeles and uh, Denver and places like had conferences where people would come. And that's where we really realized how out of our element we were because we were the only people there wanting to talk about comedy and people just did not want our polished looking zine uh, the only thing we, we would actually sell more of our T-shirts. Yeah. So I actually sell our magazine. We Is that have a, a baby. Yeah. It's a, you know, baby with a fork and a knife. Oh, OK. Modest proposal. And so we I remember this one guy. Remember, Brian, do you remember when we went to that San Francisco zine symposium and this guy like like walked up so quickly to our table? Mm -hmm. He was like, hey, how much is that? And he pointed at the T-shirt and we were like, oh, it's like. 20 bucks and he's like and he just slapped down a 20 and was like thank you and then he walked away and i was like hey man do you want it comes with a free magazine and he just was like no and we just kept walking we were trying to give it to him for free and he didn't want it but yeah. I remember, like the the people who were into comedy 
like loved it. So we had like, you know, people would send us money in the mail or uh, I would actually contact independent bookstores all around the country. And I would just, we would sell them on consignment. So I would send them like five magazines and then they would like over the course of month, like send us just a couple dollars here and there back. And we were like selling magazines on consignment in like Maryland. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You didn't try and put them at the box offices at comedy clubs. Uh, we did try. Okay. Them. Oh, good. And they made us. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we tried um, to do that. At, at I mean, we did put them in front of like. Yeah, the, we tried to put them at the Tempe Improv, but there was a, another magazine that we had a entirely one sided war with called uh, 944. <laughs> Um, they were basically like everything we hated about everything. It was this super glossy, giant, thick magazine with perfect binding. That's where it's like, it's like where it's square on the end. It's like, it's almost like, so it looks like a small book. Uh -huh. and all it would do is just highlight the awesome parties happening in the Scottsdale, Tempe, Phoenix metropolitan area. And it just was devoid of content. It was like 90% ads and they were so goddamn successful <laughs> them so much. So they got the spot in front of the Tempe improv and uh, not us, not us. Uh, you could have gone because I, I know that they have those, those racks, right. For like the free, you know, the, 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 the free, the free weekly, weekly meet. Yeah. And, and, and then like a, an ad thing. And then the something from the Jehovah's witnesses. I mean, there was always just like a couple of different slots where you could have put a stack of those. So let's, uh, let me ask what, so you, all you're doing are article, all, just interviews in, in bonus proposal. Uh, we were writing like a bunch of humor pieces and stuff, which uh, you know, and we had different comedians writing for us. Like Jen Kirkman wrote a piece for us. Like Nick Wegg. What was that? What was what was Jen Kirkman's one? It was like a essay about like uh, her being obsessed with the song Moby Dick when she was like in high school. The Led Zeppelin song. Okay. Uh, it was very funny. You know, in true Jen Kirkman form, it was just like a really funny personal essay. And so we would also publish stuff like that, and some of that's included in the book as well. So there's we personal, a, yeah, there's personal we did a bunch essays, of comics too. And like, so with different James Kolchaka would give us stuff to print and uh, our friend Mike Hollingsworth would give us comics. And so a lot of people from like the indie comic world would like uh, submit stuff and we publish that as well. Right. Well, I mean, what, what I, it sounds like the th great thing about zines is the same thing that's great about regular comic books and, um, and stand up where it, anyone could make it, anyone can do it. And you could put it out there and it could be about anything. So what were, was it, I mean, what were the comics about? Were the comics, they were supposed to be funny, right? Every, that was the theme, right? Everybody was supposed to. I mean, we missed the mark on that often, but everything was supposed <laughs> to be in the zine, including the interviews, which a lot of times the comedians didn't know we were also trying to be funny with our questions. So they just kind of came across as dickish. Um, so we missed the mark on a lot of things, but we we're, you know, young comedic writers. Um, sure. Yeah, everything was just supposed to be funny. And yeah, we would publish anything that we thought was funny. And doing, doing the anthology was like definitely part cringe when you're looking at your early comedy writing and your attempt like a lot of times we make jokes and you just move on with your life. You're like, oh, that joke bombed. And it's like, oh no, look, <laughs> this one got printed and you have to go back and reread it. And then there's other times where we look at stuff, we're like, oh, that's pretty good. Like that's not too bad, so. Yeah, it's uh, it's so interesting. Like in, in, in your favorite zines, were they also doing interviews and essays and comics? Not a lot of them, because again, that would be like trying too hard. So. so Usually it was like one thing, you know, they would just like write stories about their life or they would have like an interview with one musician or, you know. Yeah, I remember one guy just, it was all about bicycles and it was just all about how he biked everywhere. And I, I especially it was really entertaining. I can't remember the name of it, but I remember it was just about bicycles. It was always like hyper intensely specific and extremely personal. 
That sounds like quite a dorkdom. That sounds like a dork forest of a of a like each zine is like, I'm good. I like bicycles, so I'm going to tell you where I biked, what bike I'm I'm riding, what bike I would like to ride if I had the money to buy that bike, uh, how I fixed this this part of this bike that broke while I was it just that was ex- like you literally just described that zine that I love. <laughs> <laughs> there's something very calming about reading the just everything about one extremely specific little part of the world uh and then it would just be in these bite-sized chunks like you know you'd be done with it like 20 to 30 minutes and they, they, they're a page to what like 10 pages yeah kind of and a lot of them like not all of them but a lot of them were in that that amount of time like you know, yeah. that, that amount of space i mean yeah, it, it felt like uh, the ones that I would see sometimes felt like they didn't have, they only owned that one piece of paper. So they had put a lot of the art and the writing super small in the corner and then filled up the paper as much as they could. Is that, was that common? <laughs> what was yeah. that like? That, yeah, that's what we did with our first issue. And that's when everybody hated it because we like just jammed it full of every single word we could think of, which Ron... Yeah hazarded me against but i was like no people want more words well ryan's like always like a word guy he's like words are with, like that's the the reason why people are reading they don't read it for the white space they read it for the words and so i would just be like yeah but the white space makes it look nice and he's like we don't need that and then over time he finally acquiesced and people would be like hey this looks nice and i would be like thank you because i usually <laughs> was the one who made it look pretty right um that is so what are you guys doing it online now are you what are you doing now with it yeah we put uh some of the news some of the stuff that we didn't include in the book we have on our new website and um we have some of the interviews from the book in on the website as well but most of it's just collected in the book i don't know what we'll totally do with our website but you know the 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 i did interview danny tamborelli uh, from the adventures of pete and pete which was a show on nickelodeon he was the younger pete and uh i always wanted to interview him for the magazine and it didn't work out so i was like you know what uh we have a, a comic friend jim twos uh, a new comic from new york who's actually friends with him and i was like hey man can i get danny Temporelli's like email <laughs> he just gave it to me and i was like hey, can i interview you and he's like sure yeah no problem so yeah, yeah. so that's one of the new interviews coming out but i really love the anthology was like I don't know, it was just like one of those things that we just stopped doing and it felt so incomplete. And so and the one thing about this whole lockdown situation was it, it, it allowed us to contact a lot of people who I think were down to look back and comment on their old interviews who maybe if the world was just normal, like they probably wouldn't have time or be interested. Right, so, too fast, too much. It, yeah, people were like, really, I was surprised at how many people were down to play and how, how much like they kind of enjoyed the look back. And yeah. uh, it was kind of cool. Like I was, I was really nervous about contacting people. And like two of the first people I reached out to were David Cross and Anthony Jeselnik. And they both said yes immediately. And I was like, well, if they'll say yes, uh, a lot more people will probably say yes. So it was cool. I remember Anthony got right back to me he's like yeah i have absolutely nothing to do you know. <laughs> yeah it's uh and you gotta ask i mean that's if there's anything i've learned from <laughs> elliot cation and absolutely uh my life is that you have to ask um might as well what are they gonna do say no uh i i've been saying no because a lot of people are like you're bored right and i'm like I was and then everybody was asked is asking me to do things and so is now everybody I'm like, making a thing Everybody's making a thing, which is awesome, right? And if I can, I, I'm like, yeah, I can do it. But if I can't, I can't. Uh, there's there's Marvel Puzzle Quest to, to, to do. There's all kinds of, there's, but what, um, I, I here's what, I'm curious. So you're interviewing, like, so you call the Pete and Pete guy or you talk to the Pete and Pete guy to interview him. What questions make it different than just a magazine interview? Well, when we were doing Modest Proposal magazine back in the day, really what it came down to was two young guys who wanted to start doing comedy and didn't know what to do. So I think this was our way of just like, how do can we talk to super mega famous comedians? Number one, be funny so they like us. 
And number two, learn something from them. And so a lot of the questions were basically like, you know, so when you got started, like, you know, they're so <laughs> like, just in the, your, the question is like, it probably wasn't as good as a professional magazine interview, but it was very personal and, you know, it was, it got people going off on these weird tangents that were super fun. And That's I never, great. you know, the nice thing is, you know, with the anthology, you know, you have to go back and reread everything and, and edit it and reading back, man, there are some nuggets of gold in there from comics, like just the way they approach the world and like, look at life. Uh, like the Amy Sedaris had such like a, just such a positive outlook towards everything. And just through like, that like it was all about the sheer act of creating like that was like the important thing not and it was just i am like looking back i'm like man some of these these a lot of this like stands the test of time with the what you could learn from it or learn from that right um because it's so interesting that um that that what what you're doing is you're just doing this is the hardest way to start doing stand-up comedy ever no, it was we're the gonna- dumbest thing in the world yeah you could have just gone to open mic, but no, no, we're going to create a magazine. Jackie, we can't show up to the open mic without a magazine. Are you, are you crazy? <laughs> They're going to give, I have to have 45 minutes of stand up before I even go to that. Open it mic. Was, and you're like, for not a gonna- while, it was like a weird thing where it was this weird thing that kind of separated us because we also did like a duo act at the time. And so we would perform as a duo, which was already kind of a curveball. And then we were these guys who had this magazine and it was almost like, like people would sometimes talk to us about the magazine. Like, you, you know, you talk to somebody about your kid, like, Hey, so how's your kid? Is it, is he good? Right. Is it right. is going okay? Like, you you and, got him in the car? Yeah, and people just didn't like, they thought it was cool, but it was just this weird thing. And they were like, so how do you like distribute this? And that was like, always such like, I mean, that's the whole thing with zines is, I mean, we were, we were like indie to the core, you know? So a lot of it was just us doing shows and having magazines in the front, you know, and taking over the world $3 at a time. Sure, sure. Go to then- every comedy show and go up to every comedian afterwards and like make sure to hand them a copy and just, you know, try to get the word out. And I remember, a comedian Matt Manser later told us, he's like, man, when I first saw you guys giving out magazines to everybody, I was just like, these guys really want to be liked. <laughs> <laughs> just cared too much. But I remember we, once I gave uh, Ralphie May was uh, performing at the Tempe Improv and I worked there as a waiter. Ryan and I would perform there all the time. And I remember we gave him a copy of the magazine and he peeled off a 10 and gave it to him. I was like, oh man, it's only three bucks. And he's like, this shit costs a lot more than three bucks to print and I was like he's like no but he's like nice work man and I, it was like the nicest thing of like when you have a headliner who's doing well and they're just yeah. like oh, Ralph, nice Ra- Ralphie May yeah he was a really nice guy I featured for him once at Cobbs the big one in San Francisco mm-hmm. and um I will never forget this actually just because I he was doing the Thursday through Saturday and then I worked with Bill Maher on Sunday and they had a comparable act. It was this crazy libertarian-y kind of, like their jokes were different, but they were, uh, they had the same vibe to them. And Ralphie May was such a nice man. And, uh, and, and after, I think after my first set, my second set, I think, he was like, why are you featuring for me? And I said, because I can't fill this room. That's what I'm anyway uh so uh he was like as you can see neither can i uh (laughs) he had just done a bay area show like two months earlier and uh and then the sunday was with bill maher and he packed it to the gills and uh he was not nice he was uh he was a it was it was dumb i was in the green room he came up to the green room he said to me are you gonna need this room and i said the green room and he goes yeah, you know, I kind of need to be alone with his 12 entourage. And uh, and I said, yeah, there's a coat rack downstairs. I could just stand there until I go up. And um, and he didn't even hear me say that there was a coat rack that I was going to stand in. Uh, and he was like, oh, good. We, that You know what? We uh, did a whole weekend at the Tempe Improv with Daryl Hammond, and he wouldn't let us in the green room the entire weekend. Although on the way out, he did look at us in the eye and go, pretty weird stuff. And then he just kept walking. So <laughs> I think he's a pretty weird good stuff or something. It wasn't entirely negative, but he definitely, I think uh, he definitely oh, wanted his alone time. Oh, about 
That's interesting. Like he wanted a dressing room, I think is what he must have. And maybe that's what these guys are wanting. And uh, and I am not at that level, I guess. Yeah, we, we got really okay just hanging out on the balcony that weekend. We're like, I guess we'll just hang out here. Good news. It's uh, Tempe, Arizona, and it's not uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota in, in February. So there's that. Though I'm sure Tempe is like 111. It yeah. yeah real sweaty in our suit we used to wear suits too so we'd have to stand outside in 100 degree heat you two um, are adorable you guys it, it i was, am talking to ryan really mckee brutal. and ron babcock and it's at the ryan mckee m-c-k-e-e and at ron babcock spelled like ron babcock and then uh they uh did a zine uh, for several years called Modest Proposal. And there's a new book, Modest Proposal Anthology. And uh, I just thought I would tell people who I'm talking to again. I think that was a good idea. What the heck, right? Yeah, right. You're like, you're like a pro. <laughs> well, 14 years in, why not? You're like, and you've done like what, almost 600 episodes? 800, because there's 213 that are, the audio is so bad because it was, it was done. That's why I don't like doing Zoom shows is it reminds me of when they were all just conference calls with blog talk radio. I did 200 episodes with Joe Wilson. Wow. Yeah. That's right. I remember those. Yeah. Yeah. Back in the day. And the speaking of not knowing and trying too hard and yep, you just, you just keep plugging along. And I had like 500 listeners and that's fine. It's uh, better than none. <laughs> How many did you guys end up selling? Did you guys, like, what are what are small numbers? What are big numbers? I'm sure you were somewhere in the middle. Right. I have no idea. What do you think we actually sold cumulatively? Like, of the uh, magazines, we probably sold. I don't so know. How I, you, what was we, the print run? Well, the print run was like 1,500, and we probably, and we did six, and we probably actually sold maybe 500 over the three years. And no, I, I, I don't know about that, because we turned on the print run, and for the last one, we, we went up to, to like 2,500. I would say we definitely kind of had a break, like a 1,000 or two for sold. Or, I mean, or, well, and when you say sold, it's just, I mean, and that's given away too, which is fine. Oh, if you're counting given away, yeah, we've definitely thousands. Yeah, uh, okay. thousands, but we, we actually probably sold, you know, a quarter of that. Yeah, but, but at least, um, cause the thing, I mean, there's a certain point where you're like, no, take it, please see, yeah. see, see, see my comedy, see my art, see my writing. He, exactly. Cause at one point you're like, well, what's it? It's, it's in our trunk. It's not doing any good there. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's like three dollars. It's like, listen, we're not going to make money at this at all anyway, but it's it's, you know, Ryan's money. So what's the big deal? <laughs> well, the thing was, is like I, I really thought it was like somebody was going to see it and love it, like some producer or somebody and like ask us to do. So. I, I don't know why I thought that would be the thing. And, you know, very early on in this process, we had met uh, Dave Anthony, the comedian. And oh, my Pop God, I forgot about. Yeah, he told us he's like, guys, this is great, but nobody in LA is going to care about this. And we're like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. And he was right. So right. It's weird, though, because like he does the dollop now. Mm -hmm. And you would think nobody in LA would care about that. But uh, they've got like 100,000 listeners. And yeah, and I and he gets work from it, you know, so yeah, they um, do theaters now. Yeah. And the weird thing is, is too, is that there's a certain point with all of this stuff that if you did it so people cared about it, it's like a po like a podcast, like uh, like stand up comedy. If you got into stand up comedy for the money, you're an idiot. Uh, there's I mean, it's a crapshoot. There is something to the whole like not caring thing we were talking about before. Like that cannot be the main motivator. Like it has to be the core thing that motivates you to do something, not the fact that it's going to be consumed by anybody else. Like the sheer act of it has to be the thing that is the reason why you're doing it. Yeah. The Amy Sedaris comment, the fact that, that, that you do the work cause you like the work. I mean, the dork forest is a fair amount of work. Um, but I, I do it cause I love it. And, and I, you know I, what, yeah. if that forest ever catches on fire, Ryan McKee is going to put it out. <laughs> what so that's bananas that you were a firefighter yeah you think that when you go camping there'd be one guy who actually would know how to start the fire he's okay at it 
No, so I'm, what did you, did you it, go out into the woods with like a fire extinguisher or a hose or something? What, how do you he, fight fire? He had a really long guarded hose he would go out with and he'd just spray that around. I was on a 20 person fire crew. They called it a hot shot crew. And they would uh, send us to like the biggest, uh, they call it a complex fire. So that was fires that got you know, too big after the initial response and there had to be multiple crews on it. And so we would travel all the way around the Western United States and you would just hike into these areas with chainsaws and shovels and digging equipment and you would cut fire line. So there would be a break in the forest. Oh. Like do a back burn, which is like you would start a fire along the, uh, along the fire break that you just cut and then fire sucks fire, so it would burn out its fuel and put it out. So you would put out fire with fire. And he would wow. literally show up to places and be like, what do you do? And he's like, I'm a hot shot. Like that was the <laughs> term that they would call themselves, which I was like, that's so cool. And why wouldn't they call themselves hot shots, right? Because it's fire and they're hot shots. They're helpers. It's, uh, that's awesome. I didn't come up with the name. I always thought it was ridiculous, but that's how they differentiated like different crews from like, you know, Helitech or, uh, you know, the smoke jumpers or stuff like that. Oh, like every, every team had a name, you know? Yeah. Every team had a cool ass name. I'm a smoke jumper. I'm a hot shot. I'm Helitech. <laughs> uh, Helitech, they probably run the helicopters. Do they work on the? Yeah. Very good. I sure I can I can follow along. It's uh, so. Are there any zines you're reading today? That are, are there people still making them? I don't know. Um, I mean, I would... what happened to your punk rock roots, man? It has I, to be right. I got old, and the internet came along, and you know, I've certainly still like try to keep up with the people I met who were doing zines, and they've gone on to like create other stuff, like. Ron mentioned earlier the zine uh, Fart Party. That was by a very talented uh, you know, co uh, comic artist named Julia Wirtz. And she continues to like make cool stuff. And we met Mike Hollingsworth there. You know, he's gone on to do like Bojack Horseman and stuff like that. So I still like, you know, read the stuff of my friends that did it back then, but I haven't kept up with it. And we, we have one friend who used to help us with the zine who he kind of kept up with that world uh, in Phoenix and he got kind of old and kind of like they kind of kicked him out like the kids they were like you can't I, I think he was also like trying to run things you know because he was like I, you know I'm a I'm a senior at this but he uh, yeah you kind of age out of it just like punk rock I guess yeah it's uh, it's interesting and plus I think why do I think that a lot of them were over at like record stores and I know vinyl is back, but it's not back back. I mean, it's not, it's put the zines now either. You know, there's no, you know, there's very few indie bookstores or record stores. Right. Cause I know that, that there's uh, web comics that people are doing. Yeah. And that seems to have taken that space a little bit where people are doing their own art and then they're writing a little essay on the bottom, but they, they, they're Everybody not. Everybody has the, like an Instagram profile, basically. You know, I mean, I just started following uh, Marianne Ways. I started doing an Instagram about 1940s buildings from New York City. Oh, wow. You know, that's pretty zine kind of friendly, but it's just on Instagram and, you know, it's just posts and it's just, uh, you know, words. And then it's immediately, it's immediately distributed without any cost to you whatsoever. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, remember Kate, there was a Canadian uh, comic uh, draw, draw, drawer of comics and it was like Kate Bitana or something or Kate, uh, Kate Beaton, probably. I don't know. Uh, yeah. She's the Kate Beaton and she, did these comics that were that like this feels zany, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I know exactly. Yeah. I recommend absolutely. It. And she's she, her stuff is hilarious. And um, but the um, I and I haven't read it probably in two years. But uh, it was because uh, there's so much content now. It's hard to keep up, like you were saying. But she would she would do some sort of like weird historical cartoon and then she would write sort of the information about that history and make jokes. And that feels like a zine kind of sitch, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that the I feel like all the new mediums that the web brought us have kind of like eliminated the need for 
zines, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure kids still make them who, you know, want to be true punk rock and throwback, but you don't see them like you used to. And like one of the guys who we were in love with his, uh, his zine, it was called his, he's an artist that goes by Lev and he did the tales of mere existence. And he's gone on to like make a, you know, a, a really popular YouTube channel with the same name where he just like turned his comics into videos now. So I feel like uh, it's kind of evolved with it. Yeah. He's still, uh, and you know, we, we republished his interview and he was one of the guys who got back to us and he gave a great like update and you know, he's just still doing the kind of essentially the same thing he was doing before. But it's just, he just kept doing it and his audience kept growing bigger and bigger. And it's like, and his content, his style is like, changed a little bit but it's the core of it's still there yeah pretty standard pretty standard that's that's amazing well you guys it's been an hour so uh i this has been fascinating it makes me i'll notice them if i go now to like because i know especially in phoenix tempe that there's um there's sort of a halfway there's there's a book uh uh vinyl store that's a bit of a chain there's like three of them oh zia records yeah. yeah, and um, and so that uh, w- the next time I go in there, I'm gonna look for zines. You guys, you know what? Absolutely, because they were one of the few advertisers in uh, the old modest proposal. And you know, if you see a zine, pick one up because it's like let's sit down and see what this 15 year old thinks about what. <laughs> right, because it's gonna take you 20 minutes to read it, and mm-hmm. it's not, and it's, it'll be fine. And it's then you don't like- know what to do with it. That's the my thing with zines is I like this thing, but I'm also like, right, I'll tell you, I'm like the biggest minimalist. I hate stuff, mm-hmm. so like I love zines, but I also was just like they gave me such anxiety because I just see a pile of them, and I'm like, what do I do with all these fucking zines now? Well, I guess 30 years from now, you have to pray that he, uh, whoever wrote them, they they become a huge deal and then sell it on eBay. Yeah, everybody it- else threw them out. There you go. Yeah, I think that the, the Mike Magazine model still still guiding us after all these years. <laughs> okay, uh, Rangers, we have been talking with Ryan McKee and Ron Babcock. It's at the Ryan McKee, M-C-K-E-E, and at Ron Babcock. And Modest Proposal Anthology is for sale everywhere that you would get such a thing. Uh, it's a book. So, uh, uh, But you could also go to modestproposal.co and read uh, the new interview upcoming and, and any new content and some stuff that didn't make the book. Thank you so much for being on the show, you guys. Oh, thanks for having us, Jackie. This has been a lot of fun. Absolutely. And uh, Rangers, you know the rules out there. Take care of each other. My hat, my hat, my hat. They're dancing around my hat. (laughs) My hat, my hat, my hat. Well, what do you think of that? If it looks like a Mexican hat dance and it sounds like a Mexican hat dance, it's most likely a Mexican hat dance. So take off your hat and let's dance. Yay! Oh, my God. Why don't we just call that as the end of the show?